Hello, and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week, we welcome Professor Eric Agall from the University of Washington to the show. He's an astrophysicist working on studying exoplanets, and we'll be talking about his work uncovering conditions in the seven planets of the TRAPPIST-1 system. But first, we look at a study proposing a new way to find dark matter, one of the greatest mysteries in astrophysics. Next, we examine a possible new method for seeing long, elusive gravitational waves. Finally, we're going to hear the story of a student astronomer who may have found a missing piece of the cosmos. Back in the 1920s, a pair of physicists named Theodore, Theodore Kaluza and Oscar Klein first suggested that the cosmos may consist of dimensions beyond those we experience in everyday life. Although this fantastic idea solves several mathematical questions about the cosmos, it was impossible to prove by experiment. Now, a new study suggests that dark matter may interact with this extra dimension, producing a so far unseen massive particle, which physicists may be able to detect. However, there are currently no detectors on the planet powerful enough to carry out such an experiment. Gravitational waves, ripples in the fabric of space-time, first predicted by Albert Einstein a century ago, have never been directly observed. Now, a new study which examined regular flashes of electromagnetic radiation from pulsars found the timings of pulses were affected by the presence of massive gravitational fields. And these waves move the Earth just a tiny amount. Now, further analysis will hopefully determine whether or not this phenomenon was, in fact, caused by gravitational waves. Roughly 95% of the universe is found in the form of dark matter and dark energy, while 5% is normal or baryonic matter. However, astronomers only see half of the amount of baryonic matter known to exist around the universe. A team of researchers led by doctoral student Yan Ming Wang from the University of Sydney looked at light from distant galaxies, finding they twinkled like a star at night. This twinkling is believed to be the result of clouds of hydrogen snow, too cold and dispersed to be seen directly using current technology. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Today, we're joined by Professor Eric Agall from the University of Washington. He is an astrophysicist focused on the study of exoplanets. And we're going to talk about his work uh, examining the ever-intriguing planets of the TRAPPIST-1 system.
this week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. We're happy to welcome Professor Eric Agall. He is an astrophysicist at the University of Washington, and he's recently made some interesting findings about the TRAPPIST-1 system of exoplanets. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thanks for having me today. Glad to be here. Great. So uh, could tell us, just give us a little intro to the TRAPPIST-1 system and what do we know about it and what makes it such an intriguing tar target to study? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. So the first exoplanets around stars similar to our sun were found in the 1990s. And the first ones that were found were quite large planets, more like the size of Jupiter very dissimilar to the planet that we live on, the Earth, which we refer to as a terrestrial planet. And so part of the process of discovering planets around other stars has been that we hope to someday find a planet similar to our Earth, eventually around a star similar to our sun, because that's the one example we have of a life-supporting planet. But the TRAPPIST-1 system has been very exciting uh, discovery that happened three years ago in, in 2017 we found seven planets orbiting a very small star. The star is extremely uh, tiny by star standards. It's almost not a star. It's about 12% uh, of the radius of our sun and only 9% of the mass of our sun. But that small size actually made it possible to find very small planets similar to the terrestrial planets in our solar system like the Earth. And these seven planets actually are, are the most similar in the properties to the terrestrial planets in our solar system for any solar system that we've found planets around to date. And so that's led to a lot of excitement by astronomers in being able finally to, to study planets that are possibly similar to the terrestrial planets in our solar system, one of which we know to host life. So since that 2017 discovery, we've been continuing to follow up and make uh, better measurements of the, these planets in this star system. And so we've reported uh, just last Friday the, the uh, final measurements of the planet's properties based on NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope. Hmm. And can you tell us you know, about some of the, you mentioned Spitzer, but can you talk a little bit about some of the tools you used, how the data was collected, as well as you know, techniques that you utilize to sift through all this data to come to these, these conclusions. Certainly, yeah. So the first planets found around the star actually were announced in 2016. They found two planets and hints of a third planet. And then um, the way that they did this was using ground-based telescopes um, with a survey called the TRAPPIST survey. This is a long acronym, which I don't recall the, the words to, but um, the, the head of that survey is Belgian and they're proud of their Trappist beer. So they chose that acronym to, uh, in honor of their heritage. The telescope was however, based in Chile uh, was an automated telescope and it basically went to all the nearby small stars uh, and looked for the passage of a planet in front of the star. This is something we refer, we refer to as a transit. We see transits in our solar system of, of Venus and Mercury as they go in front of our sun. And when they do that, they block a little bit of light from the sun. The sun comes becomes a little bit dimmer, very hard to notice, but uh, because we can take pictures of the sun, we can see that little shadow pass across that star. And so they essentially did this with these other stars. They surveyed 50 nearby dwarf stars, which are uh, the very end of the stellar burning sequence. They're um, just massive enough to be able to, to burn nuclear fuel in their centers and to be able to glow. So they looked at these 50 stars over several years and looked for a little dip in the brightness of the star as a planet might orbit in front of it. Now this is kind of improbable because planetary systems tend to be fairly flat. And so if you look at a random star, it's planets may not orbit in front of that star. So you gotta look at a lot, a lot of stars, enough stars to have the probability or possibility that the planet's orbits would pass in front of the star and cause these periodic dips. Well, they got lucky and out of these 50 stars, they found one that had these um, three planets initially. Then we took the Spitzer Space Telescope and stared at the star. I had joined this project at, at this point after the discovery of the first few planets. We stared at the star for 20 days and what we found was incredible. We found 
dips that corresponded to seven different planets that happened periodically. The innermost planet happens every one and a half days and the outermost one almost uh, 19 days to take uh, for it to go around the star. So the years on these planets are extremely short. These also probably correspond to the days on these planets. In fact, the days are almost kind of permanent because the planets are so close to their star in their orbits that they should be tidally locked to the star, meaning that the same size of the planet is facing the star as the planet orbits the star, much like the moon is locked to the earth. So we see the same side of the moon. The moon's rotating once every time it orbits the earth, similar to these planets, we think. Um, and so the, uh, the planets in the system uh, have uh, these very short years. However, the star is extremely dim. So because it's such a small star, it puts a, a pittance of energy compared to our sun, about one in 2000 of the amount of energy. And so several of these planets, the fourth, fifth, and sixth ones are at distances which correspond to a range of um, flux hitting the, the planet from the star that if, if these planets had an Earth-like atmosphere, which we don't know yet, but if they did, they might have surface temperatures which would allow for liquid water. So this is um, all speculative. We don't know anything about the atmospheres, but the exciting part is that these are similar in size to the Earth and they have a similar um, incident flux which could create a possibly with some greenhouse warming, a temperature on the surface of these planets that could allow for liquid water. Hmm. Like to, so now what we've done is that, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. So what we've done then after that 20 day, staring at the star for 20 days with the Spitzer Space Telescope, we figured out where, when the planets would go in front of the star. And so we scheduled further time over several years to um, catch each of the transits as the planets went in front of the star. Do with that was um, measure the mass of the planets. And the way this works is that the planets, as they orbit the star, every so often they'll pass one another in their orbits. And when they do so, the gravitational pulls of the planets tug on one another, and that mm. slightly changes the speed at which they're orbiting. And then the next time the planet comes in front of the star, it'll either be a little bit earlier or a little bit later, depending on what the nature of that uh, tug was to the other planets. And so from that effect, we can actually measure the planet's masses by the time they go in front of the star and modeling the gravitational interactions of the seven planets. This was a fairly complicated effort, but we uh, did this over the uh, good part of 2020, including during the pandemic, and uh, we're able to derive the masses of the planets relative to the star, and from the depths of the transits, we could gauge the size of the planet relative to the star based on how much of the star the planet was blocking. And then from that, those radius ratios and mass ratios with the properties of the star, we could get very precise uh, measurements of the, of the properties of the planets. And this is the, really the first time we've been able to do this for terrestrial planets, multiple terrestrial planets around uh, another star outside of our solar system. And this has led to uh, you know, a really huge increase in precision over previous studies. That's, that's fascinating. Um, so we talked a little, you talked a little bit uh, about these planets all being roughly the same uh, size and mass as the Earth. Um, can you tell us, like, why, why would all of these planets seem to be so similar in mass yeah. and size when, when the planets in our solar system are so different from each other? That's a good question. It's a mystery that we're, uh, you know, we're still trying to solve. Um, and one of the exciting things about this system is that we're starting to really to do precise planetary science, but not with planets around our sun, but around another star. Um, and so what a couple possibilities we've passed around is that perhaps these planets all have a similar makeup to one another. Now with our terrestrial planets, Mars, Venus, and Earth also seem to have a very similar makeup to one another. Mercury, much closer to our sun, is an exception. It has a much more iron uh, per unit mass than Mars, Venus, and Earth. And roughly speaking, Mars, Venus, and Earth, we can explain uh, approximately with a composition which is about 30%, 30 to 33% iron, 
and the remainder uh, percentage of the mass is rock with a very, very small percentage of other things like water and atmosphere that don't contribute much to the overall um, <clears throat> size and masses of, of the planets. So with, uh, with, those, with that ratio, primarily of iron to rock, uh, that determines then the density of the planet. Uh, of course, denser planets, um, if you were to um, you know, stick them in water, they'd sink and lighter density planets would, would rise. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Saturn is uh, the lowest density planet in our solar system. It's primarily gaseous as well as uh, Jupiter and then the, uh, ice giants have uh, both gases and ice. And they are much lower density due to the comp their compositions, which are uh, be because of the gas and ice components um, have a much lower density than the terrestrial planets. So for our solar system, Mars, Venus, and Earth are kind of the analog uh, that we can study relative to the TRAPPIST-1 system. And what we find is that the TRAPPIST-1 planets are all similar to one another, but with a slightly larger size relative to their mass, which means a lower density. And so one possibility is that maybe these planets have a different ratio of iron to rock than Earth, Venus, and Mars. Uh, perhaps their star uh, <clears throat> that gave birth to these planets as well, we think, uh, maybe it started out with less iron than our sun did. So that's one, one possibility, is that the, the cosmic abundance uh, of iron relative to silicon and magnesium, uh, which are the primary uh, heavy element constituents of rock. Maybe that varies from star to star, and so maybe the star is, uh, has less iron relative to our sun. The other component that's really important is, uh, is oxygen. And so another possibility is that maybe the planets in this other, in the TRAPPIST-1 system, have more oxygen relative to um, Earth, Venus, and Mars. And that actually is an interesting idea that, that uh, the iron can actually be oxidized and basically rusted hmm. and then distributed throughout the planet rather than having an iron core as we, as we do for our Earth. Our Earth has a very large uh, iron core in the center. The iron basically sinks down to the center. But if you were to oxidize the iron, then that would actually create a lower density planet because oxygen is a lower density element. And so if we added more oxygen uh, to the TRAPPIST-1 planets, we could also explain their lower density. Um, and so <clears throat> instead of having a core, if they had completely completely rusted iron throughout uh, that mixed with the rock, you could you would produce a, a lower density planet, and that actually matches our measurements extremely well. Hmm. Most likely, it's a combination of these two effects, but there's um, an infinite number of possibilities. But those are kind of the two um, extreme uh, ranges of possibilities we've studied. Another possibility would be ha have a water layer on these planets, although that really only works for the outer four planets, the inner three are too close to the star and therefore hot enough that that water would be vaporized to steam. Okay, so now made an intriguing little connection now. The, um, you're saying that, you know, the fourth, you know, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth planets are able to, may possibly uh, hold on to large amounts of water. And earlier, mm -hmm. you're also saying they're within the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone around the star where we may be most likely to find life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it turns out for life on our Earth, we don't require that much water. So the total amount of the uh, water in the oceans is uh, a fraction, a very small fraction of a percent of the mass of the Earth, like 0.05%. So it doesn't take very much water potentially to have um, you know, viable life on the surface of the planet. So these planets could still have a significant amount of water and atmosphere uh, that don't really affect the overall densities of the planets that we can measure with our current data sets. What we would like to do though is see if these planets have atmospheres and see if they have hydrospheres. I mentioned the possibility that the outer planets could have a, a layer of water and if the inter interiors of these planets were similar to the Earth or the core an iron core and the rocky mantle and the same ratios as we have in our uh, Earth, Venus, and Mars, you would have to add about 5% in mass of a wider layer to explain the lower densities of the TRAPPIST-1 planets. So that's like 100 times larger than the amount of water we have on our Earth. It would be like a water world. And that would be consistent with the data. I kind of disfavor that, that possibility though, because then it would be kind of a coincidence that the inner three planets would also seem to fall in the same 
relation as far as the composition as the outer three planets, um, which I think probably suggests that they, they maybe have a, a, a small amount of water. It could, again, still be similar to the Earth and we wouldn't um, be able to detect that, that small amount of water. But, the, um, but it, all to say, it is still another possibility for uh, explaining the sizes of these planets and their lower density relative to the Earth. Right. And if I'm correct, all these planets orbit at a distance less than the orbit between Mercury and the Sun. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we know of, you know, these red dwarf stars, you know, can be very active and put out a lot of uh, stellar storms. Mm -hmm. So have, have, do we know, have any idea or any concept of how, you know, the radiation released from these storms could possibly affect these worlds or potential life on them? Yes, and there's been quite a few studies of this. Uh, one possibility is that very um, strong uh, solar flares on the Trappist One star um, could create high energy particles that then hit the hit the planets and erode the atmospheres. Um, one property we find for the Earth is that the magnetic field actually protects the Earth, and you get these aurora effects with the high energy particles coming in at the poles, where the magnetic field lines uh, thread into the Earth. And so uh, one thing we don't know much about for the Trappist-1 planets is what, whether they have magnetic fields and if so, how strong they are and whether they act as a protective layer. Um, the other aspect of this is that um, stellar flares can also create a lot of ultraviolet light and that can have negative consequences for life as we know when we go out in a bright day and get sunburned. It can also have positive consequences uh, and can you know, possibly um, allow more variety to life. And so we're a little confused about the impact of this. It's a, it's a very complicated problem. Um, and so, uh, but it, it could be that these uh, planets are sterilized and may not have any life because of the star. But there's also, you know, the possibility that if these planets are tidally locked and, you know, life could be on the night side and be protected, that, that would be uh, a way to, uh, save life on these planets are allowed to exist. And so um, I'm kind of keeping an open mind. It, it seems um, possible that there could be life, but it, I also would not be surprised if we didn't find anything, any evidence of life on these planets as well. What we're hoping to do in the next few years is to study these planets in more detail with the bigger uh, space telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope, mm, right. which is due to launch in October. This is gonna be the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope it's going to be a larger telescope, will collect more light, and hopefully will allow us to measure the signature of molecules in the atmospheres of these planets as they pass in front of the star. The molecules absorb strongly at certain wavelengths within the thin layer of atmosphere if they have one for these planets. And so we're going to try and see if we can detect the atmospheres and see what they're made of and see if that contains any hints that, of uh, the potential for habitability. So um, right now the jury's still out about this. All right. And finally, you know, we talked a little bit about Webb. What, what would you like, how would you like to examine Trappist-1 system? What studies or tools coming up, you know, including Webb, mm -hmm. you know, um, are you really looking forward to? Well, so one thing we'd like to do is make more precise measurements of the masses and radii. You can see the scale behind me is kind of representing this mass measurement, which we didn't have a scale, but we used the interactions with the planets to measure the masses. With the James Webb Space Telescope, to look for the uh, molecular signatures I mentioned, we'd like to um, see if we can find evidence for carbon dioxide and oxygen, potentially uh, water, and if these planets have atmospheres with, the, with high abundance of, of, of those elements. But it, the, the simulations show that it's going to take many measurements of the transits of the planets in front of the star to get enough data to be able to make those measurements of molecules or detect those molecules. And so we're going to have to make uh, multiple uh, measurements and revisit the planets every time they orbit in front of the star. So that's going to take a long time with the James Webb Space Telescope, but will also give us more timing data. And so perhaps we can increase our precision on the measurement of the masses as well with the James Webb Space Telescope. So we've actually put in um, several proposals to try to do different studies on uh, different planets within the system. Uh, right now that goes through a peer review process and then they'll decide um, whether we'll get time or not. So 
fingers are crossed that we'll hopefully we'll get be able to study these in, these in more detail with James Webb. Super. Well, thanks so much, Eric. It was really great having you on the show. Great. Thanks for having me. Thanks. And that was uh, Dr. Eric Agall, um, astrophysicist at the University of Washington. Join us next week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion when we're going to talk with science columnist David W. Brown. He is a contributor for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Scientific American. We'll discuss his new book, The Mission, telling the story of NASA's upcoming project, the Europa Clipper. Join us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring space and astronomy news together with groundbreaking scientists directly to listeners and viewers around the globe. Subscribers to our VIP newsletter see every episode of this show a day before or it is made available to the general public. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or on any major podcast provider. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.